all of that, I want to get right into today's topic. And again, we're going to have a little bit of a fireside chat here on analytics. And when I was trying to think of folks that I could talk to about analytics, it made me think about the class that I teach at Case Western Reserve University. And analytics is a topic I try to teach my students. I started teaching it a few years ago. And one of my favorite guests to bring in for our students, um, and it's probably somebody that I've had the most uh, speak to our students, is Dan Olson. Uh, Dan is, I consider you a friend now, Dan. Dan's been a longtime speaker at industry, um, has been involved with Product Collective in the past, is author of the Lean Product Playbook, which is a book that I've actually assigned to my students um, in the past, but it's a it's not a book for students. It's really a book for working professionals. And so many other product people I know have made really good use of that book. And Dan, I'm just really glad that you could join us here for this little fireside chat on analytics today. No, it's great to be here with you, Mike. Always awesome to talk with you. I love what Product Collective and industry are doing. So excited to talk about analytics today. Well, thanks a lot. And I know, you know, I'm sure most of our guests are familiar with you and your work. Um, if you wouldn't mind just giving the the very brief, you know, kind of who you sure. are and what you do, I think yeah. that would be helpful yeah. too. Yeah, I basically been in product my whole career, you know, luckily in business school, I was trying to figure out what to do after business school. And I learned about product management then and people, I asked people where's the best place to learn and people told me into it. So my product manager career started into it. Um, and you know, what I do these days, I've been doing it for a while is mainly product management training workshops, so private workshops for companies that want to uplevel their team skills, public workshops, speaking at awesome events like industry, um, a little bit of consulting. That's basically what I do. I also run a big meetup. I've, I've also, I love the community product collectives built. Um, in 2014, I uh, founded a uh, lean product meetup, which is a monthly speaker series. Uh, used to be in person. Now it's online. We have over 10,000 members each month. I bring in a top speaker. Um, and then we put all the videos on our YouTube channel. So yeah, so I just, you know, I basically uh, live and breathe product management 24 hours a day. And, and I love it. And I love speaking with groups of product people like we're doing today. Well, I appreciate that. And I've, I've been out to Dan's meetup in the past and I mean, it's more than a meetup. It's like its own mini conference really that meets regularly. So I definitely, if you're in the Bay area, especially definitely recommend that you check that out. That was, that was awesome. And I appreciate you having me for that. Yeah, way back then. it was great. That's right. You spoke in there. That was awesome. And then, yeah, it's online now. So we get people, you know, when we ask people to chat, we get all the same cities that you see here. So it's, it's actually, it's been beneficial to open it up online. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I want to get right into the conversation. And, and again, we're going to kind of go in a different, a uh, few different directions when it comes to analytics, but maybe just to get started, why do you think it is so important for product people to have a good grasp on analytics in the first place? Maybe we could just start there. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, product teams are responsible for creating a successful product that actually creates value for customers. And there's a lot of uncertainty in that. There's a lot of assumptions and hypotheses that we're making about what's going to actually be successful. And so we need to use like data and learning to improve our odds and um, not to get too philosophical about it, but there's a two by two that I share in some of my talks of the types, how to think about the types of data or learning that you're, you could possibly get as a product team, right? And there's two dimensions to it. One is qualitative versus quantitative. And as I like to jokingly say, Oprah versus Spock, right? If you think about Oprah, she's really good at sitting down, kind of like you, Mike, you're kind of like Oprah. You sit down one-on-one, -on -one, you interview people, you find out what makes them tick, you really get into what they're all about. That's qualitative, right? Um, and then quantitative, we call it more like Spock. Spock's just looking at the numbers, right? You know, he's not actually talking to anybody, he's looking at the numbers. And then the other dimension is attitudinal data versus behavioral data. Now, attitudinal data is what people say or telling you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I go to the gym every week. Oh, yeah, I do that. Right. And then behavioral is what do they actually do. And so you have a two by two of that. Now, product analytics are very powerful because they live in the quadrant that is quantitative and behavioral. So, you know, with attitudinal versus behavioral, sometimes people tell you, yeah, yeah, I go to the gym every day. I floss my teeth every day. And then the behavioral, you know, is what it actually is. So if you think about how product analytics works, it's tracking actual user behavior. So people can't lie to you in that way. And then Spock loves it too, because, you know, every once in a while I share some of my lean product stuff and it's like, how many users did you talk to, Dan? You only talked to 15 users? That's not statistically significant. You know, it's like, if, you, if you're such a Spock head, you're never going to get your head around like, wait, you didn't talk to thousands of people, you know? So the good news about product analytics, you can aggregate data across thousands of users, millions of users, right? And so it's got that behavioral thing and it's got the sample size thing 
So it can be a very powerful tool in your belt. Now, obviously pre-launch, you don't have any analytics. So pre-launch, we've got to use the Oprah tools. Post-launch, you can start using the analytical tools. And so back to our overall mission of creating successful products and creating customer value, it's an essential tool post-launch to kind of see, okay, what are users actually doing? What features are they actually using so that we can kind of inform our mental model as we try to improve the product? Yeah, I, I love the way you laid it all out. And, and yeah, because sometimes people ask the question, what, what's better, qualitative or quantitative? And the right. reality is I, it's, it's both, but it also depends on the stage. And I like how you're, you're calling it out in each of those stages. Yes, that's, that's great. right. And I, yeah, and I talk about three phases of product market fit, right? Because I'm all about how do you achieve product market fit. There's before you launch your product, you obviously don't have product market fit. You got to lean heavily on the Oprah stuff. Right. As you're mm -hmm. talking to people, because it's all that messy front end stuff. You don't really know who are your users, what are their real needs, what's going to really make the difference for them. And then, um, honestly, most products, when they launch, they still don't have product market fit. So that's phase two. You've launched, but you still don't have product market fit. You still want to lean on the Oprah techniques because you're still learning, but now you can take advantage of the analytics. What are people actually doing? Right. And then phase three, if you're lucky to get there, is you've achieved a certain level of product market fit. Now it becomes much more about growth. And that's where it's much more about the, the, the analytics and the growth hacks and the experimentation, right? And that's something that happens in the product world. You may read a blog post and some companies talking about all these amazing growth hacks and experimentation, A-B testing that they're doing. They're in phase three and you're in phase one. If you try to apply those tools, it's just not going to work. So you got to be mindful of what phase you're in. And to your point, you know, I do know some companies, their founders or their culture tend to have a strong, pref can have a strong preference for the Spock mindset or the Oprah mindset, but to your point, they're both valuable. Sometimes you start in quant, you look at some analytics, you go, huh, the conversion rate is horrible through this flow, what's going on? Quant tells you what's going on and how many people are doing something or not, but it doesn't tell you why. Mm. So you need to pivot and say, okay, it's kind of like there's smoke there, but you don't know what the source of the fire is. So you need to pivot to qual and say, okay, let's go, 10, you go do 10 usability tests and see what's going on there, right? Sometimes you do qualitative, it's like, hey, we talked to 10 users, they gave us four different reasons for why they upgraded the product. You don't know what percentage of users in your population, you know, go with each of those reasons. So then you might switch to a survey to figure out the quant. So it's natural to ping pong between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, you actually touched up on an analytics, you know, the lean analytics though, too. Like, I, I know this is something that came right out of your, your book. I know you've given right. even entire talks on it. Right. Could you talk a little bit about your approach to lean analytics and, and kind of what that's all about? Yeah, it's just basically kind of, of a system systematic way called the lean analytics process of like how to kind of systematically use analytics to improve your product metrics and your business metrics. And that's the beauty. And for me, I had an epiphany moment because I, I was working into it, as I mentioned, on Quicken, which started out as a desktop product. And then as the internet came along, it became a connected desktop product. So it would like, you know, integrate all this data. But then I worked on my first pure web product, right? And I remember the day after we launched, I was like, well, how many people signed up? And the, you know, the engineer's like, well, let me just get it from the database, you know? And then we got, and then, and so we started getting this time series graph and we're like, well, there were two ways to sign up. So the next day I'm like, well, how many people signed up this way versus that way? Let me see, you know? So it was super exciting that like, you could go from having a question to having the data like that, right? And asking new questions and doing it. So that's the beauty of, of that is that you want to create a feedback loop where you can kind of like pick, okay, we think this metric is going to like have, offer the highest ROI. So let's focus on improving this conversion rate. Then with your team, you brainstorm, okay, what are all the ideas we have for improving this conversion rate? You kind of run them through a quick ROI analysis. You say, okay, we agree. This is the highest ROI idea we have to improve the conversion rate. Let's implement it. Let's roll it out. Let's see how the needle moves, right? And maybe, you know, the first time the needle doesn't move that much, but eventually you're going to learn and try stuff and it's eventually going to move the needle, right? So that's that kind of feedback loop and just getting in the flow. And, you know, there's no intrinsic limitation to the pace of that, right? So I've seen some companies do that slowly and I see other companies do it very fast, right? And it reminds me of kind of like, you know, imagine some like some, like some, some naval battle and there's like some big slow galleon ship and there's like some really small frigate that can zip around, you know, like that's kind of how some smaller companies, they can outpace their competition. If they, that learning loop, they can get that analytics learning loop quickly. They can improve their product at a much bigger velocity. You no, know, I'm seeing uh, actually a couple audience questions starting to come in and, and thank mm -hmm. you everybody for submitting questions. Keep that coming. In fact, I'm going to take one audience question Let's now just to kind of yeah. 
work it in and reward good behavior here. But like I said, keep those questions coming because I'd love to get to as many of yours as possible. Um, question is, when you're planning a new application, are there recommendations, whether it's methods, practices, uh, but are there recommendations for laying the groundwork to create uh, an application that actually has strong um, quantitative analytic potential? So very beginning stages, but how do we mm -hmm. lay that groundwork? Yeah, thanks, Rob, for your question. I think that's really important because what happens sometimes is the product's been out for a while and then we go, oh gosh, it'd be great to do analytics. And so the process of kind of setting up your product for analytics has a fancy name called instrumentation. What that means, you're kind of like instrumenting. Okay, we know we want to track this, we want to track this, we want to track this. Well, there's a little bit of work required. First thinking work to say, what do we want to instrument? What analytics do we want to track? And then on after you've instrumented it, then on the data analysis side, setting up your dashboard so that it's easy for people to see that, right? So I think the top thing I would recommend is, and I think it's great to think about the beginning is, get that analytical the analytics tool or framework in place at the beginning, because it's way easier to start with it there than trying to retrofit it later throughout all the different parts of the code, right? And so the good news is you set a new application. So not to oversimplify, but you've got web applications, you've got, and you've got, you know, mobile applications. The good news is there are analytic tools for both that you just like include, like in the web, it's going to be a JavaScript include that you do, you know, and then on your um, mobile, uh, on uh, iOS, Android, it's going to be like an SDK thing that you put into your build. And so getting that in from the beginning, it, and it's, it's just as, you know, it's, it's just an include. So it's really just about picking the right tool and getting it in there. And then that will set you up because then once the data is flowing and you see charts, that's the point you want to get to. Even if the charts are not that great, it's not the best data, that's the starting point that we're going to iterate from, right? Otherwise, you have a cold start problem. Where it's like, we really want to do analytics, but it's hard to get your foot in the door. So, so that's what I would say is like, let's at least get that framework of the JavaScript include, you know, or, or the mobile SDK in from the beginning. And, you know, even, you, you know, it's iterative, like everything else. Start out with some high-level metrics you want to track. How many users signed up? How many users, you know, logged in? You know, basic stuff like that. And then from there, you can kind of get more specialized and start to track feature usage and track other things. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And great question. Keep them coming. We'll take more uh, more questions in, in just a bit too. But I have more questions for you, Dan. I remember All right. you mentioned metrics just a little bit ago. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about just sort of metrics in general. I mean, I, I know, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to put metrics in place. It might be vanity metrics. So right. how do we make sure we're focusing on the right kind of metrics, avoid those vanity metrics too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different metrics that you can track. And um, a lot. sometimes it's kind of like when somebody loses their keys, they keep looking by the lamppost. Like, but you, sometimes you go for the easiest metrics are the ones that kind of look the best, right? And those are called like vanity metrics. Vanity metrics are metrics that look good on the graph and they make you feel good. But at the end of the day, they don't really matter that much for the success of your product or business. The number one category is probably cumulative metrics. So a cumulative metric is you keep track of it over time. Like, okay, we launched our, our new product in January. What's the total number of users that ever registered? You know, and it just kind of, the thing about the cumulative metric is they always go up into the right because you're just adding on to the old number. So it looks good because everybody loves graphs that go up into the right. But it's not that, you know, it's like, it's, it doesn't really answer the question, how are we doing right now? How are we doing this month, right? So cumulative metrics, not saying you shouldn't look at them, but that should not be the primary thing your team is focused on to do this iteration, you know, improvement loop that we want to do. Um, and, you know, sometimes when people are starting with metrics, it can be a little overwhelming. There's all these things you could track, right? And so it can be helpful to have just a high level framework of how to think about the different metrics. And that's where one of my favorites is Dave McClure's startup metric for pirates. So this uh, is a bit of an older framework. So some people don't know about it, but for the people who know about it, they really like it a lot. And it's called startup metric for pirates because it's an acronym of five, five words that spell A-A-R-R-R. -R -R. So it spells R like a pirate. So that's kind of a you know, funny little name. So the first, and it's the beauty of it, I'll just say is it applies to every business. Right, so Dave created a framework that applies to every business, which is great. The first is acquisition. The way you think about acquisition is, how do we get someone on the street or on the web or on the app store who knows nothing about our product to get to our front doorstep where they could potentially become a customer, right? That's, we call that a prospect, you know, getting someone to be a prospect from like, they don't know about your product or they've never been to your website, never been to their front door where you could potentially convert them into a customer, right? That's acquisition. And everybody has to do that, right? B2C has to do it with marketing. 
B2B has to do it with sales. Everybody has to acquire prospects in order to get customers. The second uh, letter is A, is activation. Activation means you're actually activating that prospect into a customer. However you define a customer, it could be they signed a deal or contract. It could be they pulled out their credit card. It could be they gave you their email. It just depends whatever that convert key conversion action is where someone becomes a customer. And, you know, I would probably call this conversion, but then the, the acronym would be ACR. It wouldn't quite be as priority as R. So activation and conversion are synonymous. The next one is retention. Okay, now we've got the person through the front door. They became a customer. However, you define a customer. Hopefully they stay a customer. They keep using our product. Unfortunately, as we know, people don't always stick around. They stop using your product. They kind of, you know, they, they, they go away from being an active customer. The fourth R is referral. And this is just a feedback loop where your current customers generate prospects for you by word of mouth or viral channels, right? This is the one that honestly varies the most. If you're some like enterprise B2B software, maybe there's not as much referral going on. But if you're a social product or a game or a community product, there could be referral could be very, very important. And then the final R is revenue. By virtue of people using your product, you're generating revenue for your revenue model, either because they're paying you directly or you're monetizing it through advertising or something else like that, right? So that's the idea is you've got these five areas that apply to every business. Um, in my workshops with my clients, I did discover a six with just kind of cost. When you're a bigger company, sometimes you focus on cost reduction, you know, a dollar saved on costs is just as good as a dollar in revenue as far as profit goes. So anyway, every business has those. And the point is at, a, at that level, think about your business. One of those five areas is going to be what I call the metric that matters most. Like right now, which metric offers the highest ROI opportunity, right? If we focus on acquisition, you know, how much can we benefit, you know, the business? If we focus on act, uh, retention or activation, right? And it'll change over time as you optimize it. So yeah, knowing that things do change over time as our business is evolving and you mentioned optimizing it. So how right. do we, is there a certain order to optimizing it? Like, how do we approach yeah. that? Yeah, there usually is. When, and it specifically applies when you just launch a new product. Let's say you just launched a new product, right? And I like to, in my workshop, ask the question, okay, you just launched a new product and you have to pick one metric to measure your product market fit, right? And I, people, I get all kinds of answers. I get Mao, I get Mao Dow, like monthly active users to daily active users. I get revenue. I, I get every answer, NPS. And uh, to cut to the quick, I think retention rate is the best way to track it, basically. And, and some of you, uh, the, of the listeners may have heard of the leaky bucket metaphor. And the, the leaky, I'll explain it real quick because I think it's a helpful mental model, is the idea is you've got a bucket or pail and it's got a certain amount of water in it. And the amount of water in it is the amount of customers that you're holding on to at that point in time, right? And so you can think of acquisition as like this hose that you're trying to spray the water, you know, spray the customers into your bucket. And of course, nobody has perfect aim. So maybe our, maybe our, you know, our conversion rate is just like, hey, we're getting 30% of the water into the bucket. Acquisition is actually kind of how much water is going through your hose. Is it a big fire hose or is it like a little garden hose? You know, that's the volume. So you've got acquisition, Conversion is how much gets in. And then retention is, unfortunately, as we know, we don't hold on to 100% of customers over time. So retention is, gosh, we have a leak in our bucket. And by the way, everybody has a leak in their bucket. The question is just how big is the leak? How quickly is that water falling out, right? So that's the idea. And back to what I was saying before, rarely does a product when it first launch ever have great product market fit, right? And so what does that mean? It means that basically, you know, and to tie it back to the retention curve, you can think of a retention curve as plotting the water level over time. If you know what a retention curve, like it starts out high and then it goes down, it's basically, you can think about it as we start with 100%. The other thing for this analysis is just take a certain amount of time. Okay, let's take all the customers that joined in January. Let's put them in the bucket. Let's call that 100%. And let's see how quickly they drain out and leave our product, right? That's the idea. So why do I tell you all this? Well, in general, if we say, what's the optimal order? If you focus on acquisition, conversion, retention, is there an order that makes sense with this kind of metric that matters most thinking? Well, I would argue for most businesses, um, retent, you want to focus on retention first. Because if you have a big hole in your bucket and you go spend all this money and time on acquiring people and converting them, they're just going to leak out of the bucket. You're going to lose it. So it may feel good. And this kind of another vanity metric, actually, Mike, related to this is active users. Mm. Right. And a lot of comp startups like to brag about their active users. Well, active users is actually the sum of two different metrics. It's the sum of, well, how many new users did we get in that time period? And how many returning users do we have? And you can have very different dynamics of, well, startup A has 
tons of new users, but very few returning users. Startup B has tons of returning users and few uh, new users. I'd rather be startup B personally, right? Because we can always go try to get more if we've got solid retention, right? So the idea is you want to shore up your bucket. Of course, you know, not, it's never going to be perfect, but shore it up enough, right? So that when you do acquire and convert people, you're going to monetize them and, and hold on to them. The next thing you want to do is optimize your conversion rate so that before you spend money on acquisition, your conversion, your, your aim and your accuracy of converting people to customers is good. Once you've done retention, then conversion, then you can move confidently to acquisition because you're going to get a much higher ROI on the time and money that you spend there. Yeah. yeah that's helpful to, to break it all down for us because you're right. I mean, think about, go back to that active user example. If your company is, I mean, this, it would be so nice, but if your company's spending millions of dollars on marketing, you better have a lot of new users, right? But if we're not keeping those users, right. um, that's obviously, it's a big deal. That's a big problem. Yeah, and I would just add, I, I mean, I work with one client who they, because they, they, they had some friends um, at the parent company, at, this, at the company, one of the companies that ran the app store, they would get featured in the app store. Every, like once a month, oh, look, we got mm. featured again. App of the month, right, or whatever. And I looked at their data. And so every month they'd have this huge spike of active users. And the CEO was all excited saying, look, we got, you know, thousands of active users. I was like, okay, cool. Let's flip over to the retention curve. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, Mike, after three days, retention dropped to zero. So yes, we had all these people coming and trying out the app within three days. None of those people wow. that had just came ever came back. Right. And so that's the difference between the vanity metric and really what's going on. So my number one lesson is if you haven't, if you're not checking retention, start checking retention rate. If it's zero, if it drops to zero, and it may be like three days, seven days, 30 days, 60 days, but if it drops to zero, you need to shore up your leaky bucket. And, and what product market fit means is having that terminal value. If that curve, instead of going to zero, flattens out at some percentage, that tells you you have a certain level of product market fit. So um, you want to shore that up first. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned focusing on the wrong kind of metric. That would be a giant mistake. Are there other mistakes that you see commonly made by product people when it comes to analytics that are worth mentioning here? Yeah. I mean, one thing is people not using the greatest tools. Sometimes people just use whatever it's kind of random in some companies, what tools they use. Oh, this tool was free. So we used it or the person who was here before picked this tool, you know, and in general, I'm not like a tool snob or anything. It's like, Hey, and you know, I, I'm much more like, Hey, most tools can get the job done. But in the world of analytics, there are some that are more basic and there's kind of like the kind of ones and it's funny because even the advanced ones, they, they have similar feature sets. You know, obviously they're trying to out innovate each other and add cool new stuff, but they have the basics. And I think one of the basics is what I just mentioned, retention rate tracking, right? Mm -hmm. You should be able to easy go in, easily go in and quickly see your retention curve for a group of users and compare that across co what we call cohorts, different groups of users, right? And you should be able to quickly be able to say, I wonder what the retention curve looks like for people that uploaded a photo versus didn't. Like that's the first level kind of analysis you want to do on retention is people that did X, took action X, and people that didn't, what's the differential in their retention rate? And if it doesn't make a difference, great. But that's how you find those, you hear those things of like, oh, once you get to so many friends on Facebook, or once you do this many things, right? That's kind of those companies have done that analysis. So, and the reality is some, some product offerings offer that and some don't. So just a quick list of modern product analytic tools. Heap is great. I uh, recommend that. Amplitude, they're about to go public, actually. Uh, Mixpanel and Pendo. Those are kind of the four tools that will give you the insight that you need. Um, the other thing I see is sometimes people try to make their own in-house tools. You know, maybe the engine team's like, oh, we got this. I've always wanted to make an analytics tool. I'm going to do, I'm going to get my data lake and I'm going to do Redshift and all. It's like, are you in the business of building an analytics tool? No. Then just like stick to your business of building your thing and use these awesome off the shelf tools that are gonna get you what you want, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't do any in-house analytics, but it's not like some big project that, you know, that sucks up a lot of resources, so. Yeah, no, I and mean, it's true. It's like, there are companies that, that is all they're focused on is just building these tools yeah, so that right. we can get the data we need or get right. our users the access to the data that they need. So right. let's try to use them if we're able to get the, you know, yeah. what's good out of them. Does it make some more sense for each product team in the world to build their own analytics stack? Or does it make more sense for there to be a small number of companies that build best in class that everybody uses, right? And, and the other thing that they do, which is important, is they democratize the data. Like the whole point of using these tools 
in the old days, it was more like there was a central analytics group and you would go to them with your analytics request and it would go in the queue and a month later you would get your PDF report, right? right? That is the opposite of the fast feedback cycle we want. So what you wanna do, what these two tools do, they democratize the data, they make it transparent, they make it self-service. Anybody in the company, in marketing and engineering and design, PM, can go in and say, huh, I wonder what's going on over here. I wonder what these users are doing. That's how you kind of scale it a lot better. Yeah. Wait, I'm going to ask another question. I know we have a lot of audience questions too. So I want to get to a couple of them. Um, we'll, we'll definitely get to two or three audience questions. Um, but, you know, I know that on the, you know, that are joining us for here for this session, there are attendees that might be at companies where not everybody is, you know, as sophisticated when it comes to analytics right. and, you know, having to access the business intelligence, but truly understand it. Some people might even be building analytics and business intelligence into their own products for end users. Those end users aren't necessarily product people. So I'm curious, right. knowing that there are people that are maybe not as, um, they just haven't gone down that road as much. They're, they're not in the weeds when it comes to understanding analytics. What can we do to help those folks make the most out of analytics? Like how can we yeah. help those people that, might not be um, as sophisticated um, when it comes to understanding the tech side of it. Yeah, like anything else, there's a, there's like a spectrum of skill or knowledge, right? And at some point, everybody starts out not knowing much about metrics. And the question is, how did you learn and get better at it, right? So I think one of the things you can do, and this is just good UX design in general, is what's called pick smart defaults, right? Um, if I'm offering, you know, if I have an analytics package or I'm building an analytics package, uh, option one is I could say, okay, Mike, you, you're going to show up with a blank screen. And on the left is this Lego set. You can build whatever you want. Go for it. Well, when you're new, you don't even know what you want to build. You don't know how to build it. Right. So that's like, so it, it, that appeals to a power user. And sometimes the people that build these tools are power users. Like, oh, this is great. I can make whatever I want. So, but the reality is a lot of times for more novice users, it'd be better if you just like, you know what? Most people care about seeing how many users use their product today. Let's just put a graph there. It's called smart default. Let's just put the graph there. And if they don't want the graph, they can delete it. Or if they want to change it to a different metric, they can change it. So like, it's better instead of like a build your own adventure account, you know, build your own thing. It's like show something that you think is probably going to be near the mark for some people and make it really easy to edit it and change it. Right. Or maybe even show three things. Hey, you know, so it's more of a guide like, hey, do you want, do you care about tracking users or conversions or this, right? So kind of creating a mental model and making it easy. The other thing is simple stuff with data visualization, information visualization, make sure you label all the axes. It's, so it's super clear. What's the time frame? What metric is being plotted here? You know, what's the subset of users and events? And then the other thing that's really important is definitions, right? especially if you're doing it by default, it's like active users. The new person is not going to know what is what means an active user, right? So you can use little tool tips or something where it just explains what it is to people. So anyway, those are, you know, some quick basic things. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, all right. I'm going to go to some more audience questions. There are a few that have come in. So these are, these are great. Yeah. One goes back to when you were talking about those pirate metrics. And the question yes. was, if, you know, the uh, R, A A R R R, yeah. if that could be applied to more focused metrics within a product. Um, they bring yeah. up the example of, you know, evaluating of a feature within a product is performing well. Yeah. So could you talk more about that? Definitely. Yeah. Andrina, thank you for asking that question. It's an excellent question. And it leads to the like the next part that I talk about with R. So I talked about how, in general, for new product, you want to do retention first, conversion, and then acquisition. Just real quick on referral, I mentioned that's the one that tends to vary the most. If you are, you know, in a product where virality is really important, then you might want to focus on that first. So let's just cover that kind of corner case. Um, but then we finally get to revenue. And revenue is where while every business has to retain, convert and acquire, different businesses have different revenue models. So that's kind of part of the answer to your question is at that point in time, how you optimize revenue, how you make money is different. And so that's where we get into the more advanced concept of my talk from my talks and book, which is called the equation of your business. You know, I'm a double E, I'm a math geek, a quant guy at heart. And so whenever I think about optimizing something, I want to be able to express it as an equation, right? And if we just say, hey, grow revenue team, that's too high level to be actionable, right? So we need to break it down. And so I call it the equation of your business. You can always start with profit equals revenue minus cost. That's high level, it's not actionable. The whole trick here is how do we break down the revenue? How do we break it down? And I have examples in some of my other talks where 
okay, if you're running a subscription business, we can break it down into unique visitors. How many unique visitors came that month? Like the revenue we made in a given month is how many visitors came times the average revenue generated per visitor. Okay, well, average revenue generated per visitor, that's still too high level. How do we break that down? Well, we start to break it down into well, how many visits did they have? How many page views? How many ad impressions? So that's a way to break it down. For a SaaS, for a subscription product, it might be more, well, how many you know paying users do we have this month? And versus how many new. So in general, back to this active user thing, it's almost always beneficial to break down your customers or users into new customers from this time period. Who showed up for the first time and paid us this month versus returning customers? Who, who paid us this month, but this wasn't the first time they paid us, right? And then what happens is, for especially for SaaS subscription businesses, you can express the returning customers in this month in proportion to the customers you had last month. And we can kind of view it as like, what kind of churn did we have? Like what percentage of the people that were here last month? Let's ignore the new people this month. Just the people that came last month, how many of them came back versus how many did we lose, right? And you end up with a one minus churn kind of churn rate. And that one minus thing gives you nonlinear effects. So that's the idea is you, you're right. At some point you need to do that. The other part about feature usage is, one of the things I didn't mention is, there's, there's another distinction in metrics between atomic raw or atomic metrics, like how many users signed up today, and what I call ratio metrics, where you're taking two atomic metrics and you're making a ratio of them, right? And the example I always like to give here is, let's say you're at a startup, CEO stops by and say, hey, how's our registration page doing? I'm like, oh, let me check, boss. Hey, we got 10,000 users yesterday. Okay, great. You know. And then the next day he comes by and he says, how do we do today? I'm like, well, we got 100,000 today. Our registration page is like 10 times better. Well, no, maybe we just got featured on industry or TechCrunch or something, and we got a lot more traffic, right? So that the problem with that is it's not scale independent. It's hard to compare apples to apples over time. So the beauty of ratio metrics is they're they're more scale independent. It's like a lot of times they're percentages and things like that, that despite your volume changing, you can compare them over time, right? So back to what you were saying, just like we have an active user, we can say what percentage of our users are active out of all the users that signed up. You can also do that at the feature level and say, at a, and take as your denominator active users. Okay, last month we had 10,000 people use our product. Now, how many use feature A? Oh, 8,000? Okay, great. We had an 80% usage rate on feature A. Feature B? Oh, we only had 1,000 people. We only had a 10% usage rate. So that's the idea. You can do all these kind of same things of active users and retention, by the way, repeat usage of a feature. The essence of, of retention is just repeat usage. Of course, you wanna look at it at your global product level, but you can also look at it at the feature level to find problems with why are people coming and using this feature, but then a really high percentage are never coming back and using it again. That's that's awesome, thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we're gonna do two more audience questions and, and these are, uh, yeah, these are good ones. So, all right, this question is, how do we, and this is, and I've seen this come up before. So how do you manage when teams are split between focusing on different tools to report metrics? So you might be using one yeah. tool for front end behavior, another tool for yeah. API events. And that's just two tools. We might be at a company where there's lots of different tools that are being right. used. So yeah, right. what, what is your take on this one? Hey, who are you calling an analytics tool, man? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. My favorite one is agile tool. Who are you calling an agile tool? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So this, it yeah, totally, and you know, this specifically is front end versus back end, right? So this is what happens is if you've got the JavaScript include, it's going to capture all the front end stuff from the browser. And then you might have server side stuff, right? The unfortunate thing is a lot of times when you bring those two together, it's like, okay, the front end said we had 20,000 users last month. The back end said we had 30,000 users. What? You know, like, so sometimes you realize so it can be good to have more than one source so you can at least identify if there are any tra tracking problems. You know, one thing I skipped is when you're first instrumenting it, there's usually what I call a metrics hygiene phase. You're like, you know, all of a sudden you realize, oh, like we're double counting that event. And so the number of you, we thought the number of users, you know, you get in there and you clean things up and tax thing called, not to get too boring, but taxonomy, how you label the event so people understand what it is and things like that, and, you know, right? Um, so it happens, yeah. And, and in general, I'll abstract out, there's front end versus back end. You're gonna have multiple sources of data. And, the, and you know, like oftentimes, you know, there's some financial system that is the ultimate source of truth of like, how much did we get paid and how many people paid us and things like that. That's kind of like the revenue side of things and paying customer side of things. And then you're going to have your product analytics tool, which is going to be more about kind of usage and behavior 
right? And then you might have your marketing tool. It's much more about kind of acquisition and funnels and things like that. And you might have a server side tool versus a front end tool. So it's tough. It's, it, it can be tough. I think the best thing you can do is when they are providing similar metrics, just create a single place, some way to bring those together so you can compare them, right? And even if the numbers are off, the trends usually follow. Like it's like, oh, we had a big dip in this. Okay, we saw that on the front end and the back end, right? Or we saw a big spike. We saw that, and for, yeah, the numbers are a little different, but we saw it. When you don't see those, when there's a big change, like a spike or a dip, and you don't see it matching on the other side, that tells you there might be an instrumentation problem that you need to work out. Um, I mean, it's fine. I mean, in general, tools are going to, you know, you're going to need different tools for different teams. Um, and, uh, and you just got to figure out how can we make sure it's accurate and, and make sure each team has the data that it needs to optimize its part of the product. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see, I'll do one more audience question and then maybe like kind of final thoughts, but, sure. um, this audience question is coming from somebody that it's clear they have a product that's sold through annual subscriptions. Okay. And so their question goes back to when you mentioned retention as a, yes. as a really good metric yes. to look at. It's like, well, they're going to be retained for a full year. So how does yes. that, how does that work with an annual subscription right. type product? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So what's your, what do you think about that? Yeah. Now? Great question, Marco. It's a great question. Also gets into more advanced stuff. So one thing I will say is when we talk about retention, there's actually two different types of retention. There's, Usage retention, which is what I was talking about, like, you know, and I just want to talk about that for a sec to make it even harder. Like when I asked that question, what's the ultimate measure of product market fit? I said retention is, but I didn't say why. And if you think about it, like think of all the movies you've seen in your life. They're probably hundreds or thousands. Now think about the number of movies you've seen like six or more times. It's a lot shorter list, right? So the essence of retention is somebody goes and they try it, no matter how good or bad the sales job was, they get in there and they kick the tires. If, if your product delivers enough value for them, are they going to come back and use it again? Probably will. If they get in there, even if they have the world's best salesperson, if they get in there like, oh man, I don't get it. This thing's not really doing value, creating value for me. Are they going to come back and use it? No. So all that retention rate is, is a fancy way of like tracking when people, or do they choose to come back and use your product again? That's usage retention. The other type, which we're talking about here is purchase retention, which is called renewal, trying to have a different word, right? And so every once in a while I give my talk about my fit and I get some B2B salesperson like, Dan, 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 why do we care? They signed a five-year contract. We got the money. We got the money. Man. Why do we care if they use it or not? I got the money in the bank, right? So then I like to say, okay, great. In scenario A, you sold 50 seats. You went in, you did the training and like, you know, a couple of people tried it out, but then they just didn't stick with it. And you basically have essentially zero or one users out of your 50 seats. When it comes time to renew in five years, what do you think the odds of renewing are? Pretty low, right? Contrast to scenario B, you go in, you do the training, maybe start out with 45, 50 people. It try, it attrition's down to like, you know, 30 people, but you got this hardcore group of 30 people that love it, keep using it. When it comes time to go renew and that stakeholder says, hey, are we getting value out of this? They're going to renew, right? So usage retention is like, a, is like a forward predictor of purchase retention. And I, I think it's, you know, I don't think it's smart to ignore, to only focus on purchase retention. Now there is one other subclass here, which is, well, what if there's long periods of time between usage, like TurboTax, for example. When I ask people, how often do your taxes? The answer is usually as, as infrequently as I have to, right? People have <laughs> once a year and that's it, right? So a lot of times like, well, Dan, how do you mention, you can still measure it, right? It's just, there's one year between data points. So it doesn't give you that rapid feedback loop. So going back to something I covered at the beginning, that would be behavioral. Retention is behavioral data. What you would do is complement it with like NPS or something else that you can track more frequently. Okay, great. Hey, everyone just did their taxes in April. Let's hit them in end of April or early May and do a survey and see what they said about NPS. And that will kind of help us get some interim data until we get the real renewal data later, right? That's awesome. Well, I for everybody that asked questions for Dan, thank you for doing that. Those are great questions. Um, I'm going to ask Dan to share. Actually, I might as well do it right now. Dan, for people that maybe we didn't get to all questions um, yeah. that everybody wanted to ask. I know you're active on social. I know, yeah, you, know yeah. you have your yeah. website. Maybe you could share yeah. where folks could keep tabs on you and your work. Yeah, I got a few things online, but the one place to kind of find them all is my main website, Dan Olson. So dan-olson.com, D-A-N-O-L-S-E-N.com. There you can link to videos. So as you said, I've given multiple talks where we go in depth on, and these are great questions. Like, you know, it's like we covered 101 and the questions took us to 201. I've got talks on analytics uh, on that website. 
Um, it also will link you over to my YouTube channel where I've got even more talks. Um, and, uh, and I've got talks on, other on the Oprah side of the house too. Uh, and, and then on Twitter, I'm just at Dan Olson. And then, you know, there's the meetup. Again, you can link to the meetup. It's Lean Product Meetup from the website as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Dan, I really appreciate the time you took today. Um, I, I do like to ask everybody one final question to sort of close it out, which is, uh, you know, because sometimes these sessions, like we just learned a ton. There's a lot right. we're trying to pack in our brain. Sometimes right. it's just like that one or those one or two things that really stick with us. Right. If there were just one or two big takeaways that you hope yeah. uh, stick in people's brains from this session, what, what yeah. would you want that to be? I would say like, you know, it, if the if you honestly assess that the current analytics tool you have isn't meeting your needs, then don't be bashful about pushing for one of the modern ones that I was talking about, right? Um, and I know it's like, well, you may not have the budget authority, but there's enough kind of social proof out there that like all the best companies are using the same set of four or five analytics tools that it shouldn't be a hard sell. So that's one to set yourself up for success. The other is, you know, to kind of I would say learn a bit about the startup metrics for pirates that high level model. Uh, because it will be a good guide. And then along those lines, you know, if you've got a new product, like track your retention. If there's one thing I would say is if you're not tracking retention, track retention, because it's going to be very eye-opening like it was for my one client. To, to their jaw dropped when they saw that three day, after three days, retention went to zero, right? Because that active users and those vanity metrics can make it seem like things are, are rosier than they are. So those would be the things, top things I would say. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Dan. And, and again, thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, thanks to Logi Analytics. And again, for those of you that might have products of your own where you're embedding analytics for your end users, uh, definitely encourage you to check out Logi Analytics. We'll have more sessions like this uh, in the coming weeks. So you could check everything out at productcollective.com and industryconference.com to see what's coming up. So with all that, I appreciate it and hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone.